So look, we talked about uh, capacity assessments this morning, and so uh, it's perfectly natural now for us to move on to best interest decision making. Best interest decision making is really something that's in this broader class of surrogate decision making. Uh, there are various other standards of surrogate decision making that come into play, actually quite a lot when you start to look closely. Uh, mainly focused today on best interest decision making. Uh, we've been doing some work around that, and I think there are lots of interesting uh, issues and problems there. But we can come to some of the associated issues about advanced directives, lasting purpose attorney, um, and so on. Um, the, uh, once again, we have this sort of luxury of time, and so I propose to take things uh, in a kind of leisurely manner here. Uh, we can just explore things as they come up. But here's the plan, anyway. Uh, I'm going to go first. Viv and I are going to kind of do uh, double duty. Fabian is going to help us at the end a bit with the case studies. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about conflicting values within the MCA. Um, that wasn't actually originally part of this. Uh, but it's something that's kind of been coming up in the discussion, so I added a few slides uh, about that that's coming out of our research. And then uh, I want to go through uh, this question, uh, what I'm calling briefing one here, about when the law mandates best interest decision making. Then we've got a kind of a group work exercise I'd like to split up for uh, again, uh, as we did at one point yesterday, uh, and then uh, report back. And then Viv's going to do the second briefing which is uh, really about what the law says we're supposed to do in best interest decision making. And then quite a lot part of that is where the court has been coming down in the most recent set of cases. Um, and then we'll take the last hour or so next door and look at the case studies. Okay, that's the plan. Um, so I want to talk first about conflicting values within the MCA. And again, forgive me if I just give you just a tiny bit of logic here uh, to start off with. I'd like to introduce this term antinomy. I don't think it's, a, uh, it's familiar to philosophers and logicians, uh, maybe not, but I think it's a very useful concept. So this is not autonomy, this is antinomy. Antinomies of autonomy is what I want to get onto here. Um, so antinomy uh, comes from the Greek also, antinomos, and I'm giving you the pronunciation there because it's, it's not antimony, that's chemical element 51, I think, uh, and, and, antinomy. Um, and what is it? For a logician, it's a species of contradiction that emerges when a body of law yields inconsistent or contradictory conclusions. Kant uh, really relies on the notion of an antinomy and the critique of pure reason. He's really worried about these grand antinomies that come about when reason itself yields contradictory results. He calls that the euthanasia of pure reason. I'm interested in a much more modest form of antinomy in positive law when a body of law yields contradictory obligations. So I don't know if you can see down the bottom, you have a sort of pure schema here for a legal, uh, uh, an antinomy of, uh, of positive law. S is obliged to phi, S is obliged to not phi. You know, that's a case where a body of law is just telling you you cannot possibly satisfy both of these obligations. I don't want to say, and my thesis is not, that the MCA has antinomies in it. Lawyers are very careful at managing not to have contradictory legislation. But I do want to try to present the case that uh, the MCA, and in general, I want to say mental health legislation in any liberal jurisdiction, this is not specific to England and Wales, has an inherent tendency towards antinomial structure. It's something that essentially has to be managed. There's an intrinsic danger of antinomy whenever you try to adopt uh, health and care legislation in a, in a broadly liberal legal uh, context. So I have a bunch of examples of that that we've been working on. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, uh, but I want at least to be on the lookout for one. Can I just, before I go on, let me just say, why would we expect that to be the case? Why can't then you just have a perfectly consistent body of law in this area? We do it with traffic law, and we do it with tax law, and so on. Why would there be this? I think it's born of something that's intrinsic to the care situation. In a care situation, you're adopting two different perspectives on, if you will, the object of care, the thing you're caring for. On the one hand, you're treating it as a very complicated biological mechanism whose behavior is output to a bunch of inputs. Uh, and you can make various predictions about what it will do under various stressful circumstances. That's a kind of explain and predict uh, framework. 
theoretical, if you will, but you're also adopting uh, what Kant would call a practical or moral perspective. You're treating that object of care as an actual or potential person, somebody um, who can act for their own reasons. I think that combination of perspectives is intrinsic to the care situation and it yields a tendency towards antinomial structure. Okay, that's the end of the logic um, bit. So let me just illustrate this. I think there are quite a number of antinomies of autonomy. Um, I think uh, one of them should be named after Kerry Wolterton, um, but I'm not going to talk about that today, because um, that's a case where the antinomies come from two different bodies of legislation, the MHA and the MCA, are kind of yielding these opposed <coughs> obligations for the Kerry Wolterton case. We can talk about that if people want to. But I want to talk instead about antinomial structure that's inside the MCA. So we all know by now, uh, landmark legislation, it's been called, uh, the MCA introduced, it really sort of turns on its treatment of these two central concepts, mental capacity and best interest. Uh, it offers a definition of mental capacity. It does not offer a definition of best interest. But these are both really operative concepts um, in the law, and part of its sort of landmark status pertains to the ways in which it's tried to say something definitive about these two. When it comes to the side of mental capacity law, I mean, the governing value here in the MCA is patient autonomy. It's not the only value, maybe, but it's the main one. When we come to capacitous uh, patients, we're really trying to enhance patient autonomy, respect their autonomy when they've made a decision, but if they're, if they're uh, have diminished uh, capacity to try to enhance their ability to recover it, uh, and so on. But the main sort of uh, value that's at work there in, on the mental capacity side is that value of autonomy. Of course, various different ways that can be characterized and so on. Um, but let me just leave it at that level of generality. When it comes to the best interest side, okay, now this may be something people will want to quarrel about. <coughs> to a certain extent, Gareth and I disagree about this. I think the governing value on the best interest side is beneficence, or you could call it paternalism. We're going to talk about paternalism tomorrow. Doing good for the patient, acting in their best interests. That's not really valuing autonomy necessarily. Sometimes it may coincide in happy cases. Respecting autonomy and doing the right thing for them happen to line up, but they don't necessarily line up. And some many famous cases, some of the cases we've been struggling over, they pull in opposite directions. Um, so you've got these two, uh, these two values that are at work uh, associated with these, two, with these two concepts. I mean, it's important to say you didn't have to go that way. Sorry, this is a little bit at the bottom. I should have raised it. The, um, you didn't have to go that way. You could have let autonomy be the value all the way through, or as far as you can go. In that case, you would go for something like a substituted standard uh, for making decisions for people, rather than a best interest standard. Viv's going to talk about that in the second part of the uh, session today. Uh, but you could, some people call this an American model, where you could go uh, on a route where, look, the question when somebody lacks capacity would be, well, what would they have done? What would they have done? May, may not be the best thing for them, but the question really is I should be guided by what they would have done. So that's a case where you could have carried autonomy right through as far as you can go um, to the best interest side, um, but we haven't, uh, we haven't gotten active of that structure. For that reason, I want to say, in a certain way, we shouldn't be surprised that the MCA in practice is not always really empowering people. It's a, I mean, it's a kind of a British model, right? We're going halfway towards empowerment, but it reaches a limit when it comes to this paternalistic conception of best interest. I mean, we'll say more about that as we, um, as we go along. For now, I just want to focus on the, the antinomy part. Let's just look at this piece of it, right? Leave aside the rest. You got two values here at work in this statute, autonomy and paternalism. I want to say, well, you got two values at work, you should be on the lookout for antinomies, right? That's the makings of an antinomial structure. I can call it telltale sign of possible antinomial structure. I got two different values. I'm like two masters, somebody said yesterday. If I'm trying to serve two masters, 
inevitably the day is going to come when the two masters are telling me to do different things. So it's an intrinsic tendency towards antinomial structure. We can expect contradictory uh, uh, tendencies in, in, the, in the statute. Now look, the law is beautifully constructed so as to avoid that outcome. How does it avoid flat out? It's a terrible thing for a law to yield antinomies, so we've got to manage it. We've got these, there are different ways you could do it, right? You could say, we've got these two values, but one always trumps the other. And autonomy is the main thing, and paternalism as far as you can within autonomy. Or you could go the other way around. You could say, look, the governing one all the time is paternalism. Anyway, it, it, you, how, you, could, you could subordinate one to the other. That's not how the statute does it. it seems to me. The statute says, says, says we're going to keep these each to their own domain. We're going to draw this thick red line down the middle of the screen. We're going to say sometimes the governing value is autonomy, but in other contexts the value is beneficence. So for any particular case, we're either operating with one or we're operating with the other. They both have kind of prime authority, but each within their respective domains. So in particular, where I've got a capacitive statement, a patient, I'm going to use the word patient here, I don't care, you object, I don't know, uh, customer, fill in your favorite, um, your favorite noun here, but uh, let's just talk about patients for now. If I've got a capacitive patient, then I respect their autonomy. There the autonomy value trumps, but when I cross that red line into, uh, sorry, that should say incapacitous state of patient, when I cross that threshold and somebody who lacks capacity, then autonomy is no longer in the driving seat and beneficence, uh, beneficence is, the, is the paramount value. So that's a way of managing the antinomial danger, right? Keeping them each, each to their own domain. So we say antinomy resolved, or you could say dictated out of existence, right? That strategy works fine as long as it's the case that for any particular patient at any particular decision situation, they're either on the one side or the other, right? As long as the, we can just keep these two populations totally separate, we've got a situation where um, the antinomy is, uh, it is managed. You're not going to get contradictory cases. Of course, we all know reality is not always like that. You've got borderline cases. The case we were looking at this morning, you've got fluctuating cases. Somebody keeps crossing the line back and forth. And, so you can get, uh, you know, oscillating obligations in that sort of uh, in that sort of context. Okay, I think that's what I want to say about that. So the main points I wanted to get out there is, first of all, this concept of an, uh, of an antinomy, a certain kind of contradiction in positive law. The thought, at least I haven't really argued for this, but I tried to suggest there's an intrinsic danger of antinomial structure in care legislation in a liberal environment. And then we've got this particular example of an antinomy that needs to be managed in the MCA and a sort of strategy for, for doing that. Uh, can, I, can I pause there for a minute and if, invite comments or questions or uh, objections about that? Yes. I know we're going to be talking about the AH case, but um, listening to you, uh, and uh, if you remember that concern, this young man who was you know, dominated by his mother and mesh relationship and so on. and, and um, it, it, did, it does seem to me that uh, if truly we valued autonomy, the order of the court would have been um, an order that would most likely result in him you know, gaining capacity so he could exercise autonomy, while um, I mean, when we look at it, I would suggest what the court was really concerned with was, as it were, removing his autonomy so that it could be paternalistic. And, and, and so you can, uh, I mean, there is, I agree, in the legislation that line that you've drawn there, but um, but actually if you really valued autonomy in, in deciding, as it were, on best interests, you'd all the time be seeing yeah. if you could you know, give someone back their decision-making uh, capacity, which I think in that case was not the aim, okay. it's not the effect. Yeah, good. Well, let's talk about that particular case this afternoon. Uh, I guess part of the point I, that, that I'm trying to make is in a way exactly that, that uh, the statute does not value autonomy all the way. It could have, I think. I mean, there's certain cases where maybe you couldn't. Somebody who's never had capacity, it's hard to imagine how you could exercise a substitute. Yeah. But you know, you, there are lots of cases where we could operate with more of an autonomy value than we have. But 
I think the statute is and the statute is such that it's very definitely decided not to go that way. And in talking to some of the judges, again, you get this idea, look, there is that model, you can go more American, and this is the way it's been described to us, but we're not doing that. That's not what's happening. I think there's a really interesting historical question to ask about why it ended up where it is. There's uh, gonna have something to say about this later on. But then you're right, the second point is, once you've got this structure, you open up the possibility of sort of shoving people one way or the other, right? It can, it's a, can be a strategic decision about which of these regimes, you know, because whenever it's a really hard middle gray area case, you could make the case that it goes one way or the other, and you can choose which of these values to treat as well. So the, the law is neat, reality is messy, and exactly where it's messy, there's scope for the exercise of power in uh, manipulating some of these legal strategies. Yes? So if I, if I understand what you're saying, Maybe, maybe I understand you wrong, but I sort of heard you saying there that instead of, um, if we had a substituted judgment standard where we would just have to do for P what we thought P would want us to do, the, the fact that we don't have that, the fact that there's so much flexibility within the best interest standard actually has a destabilising effect on the capacity standard itself, because it, is that what I hear you saying? Um, I'm not sure it has a destabilizing effect on the capacity standard itself. I mean, you may be right about that. I mean, in a way, that's the, the last point. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I guess that's a social question, not a philosophical yeah. question. But I just wonder if the fact that you can save Kerry's life means that you're more tempted to fudge the capacity assessment. Whereas if you had to do what she would always have wanted, then you'd be like, yeah, she has capacity. Yeah, good, okay. So Kerry Walter, in case you can run with different antinomial structures. I mean, I primarily think, I mean, the main debate in the... Uh, British Medical Journal has been about whether you should have implement you should have exercised the Mental yeah, Health exactly. Act, right? That's a, that's another one over here altogether, and it has its own set of values. Public health and public safety, yeah. I think, are paramount yeah. there. It's not the only set, set of values, yeah. but uh, that's the main one. Um, the so I think of that as being a different antinomy. Although you could think about the Kerry Walterton case differently and say, you know, she didn't have capacity. Um, and, uh, and so we act in her best interest, whatever that turns out to be. I mean, to give a, another sort of example, some of these end of life, uh, these uh, comas and brain injury kinds of cases uh, bring out some of these, this antinomy about substituted judgment. Suppose you know very well that this patient you've, you're dealing with would not want to survive the kind of disabling injury that she suffered, right? You've got plenty of evidence, but not an advanced directive, that this is not the kind of thing she would want to survive. Um, the, uh, what happens? As long as she's uh, uh, awake and has capacity and is refusing treatment, the law says you've got to honor that refusal, right? Her autonomy is the paramount thing. But as soon as she lapses into unconsciousness at the roadside, an entirely different vet set of values kick in. Even if you know that her preference at the moment would have been not to survive, you've got to reach a decision about whether it's in her best interests overall to receive first aid at roadside and be transported to a medical facility, mm -hmm. right? In that, questions about what she would have wanted becomes one factor among many, but it's not the trumping issue. The trumping issue is beneficence. The trumping issue is what's in her best interest. Now, I think you could have written the statute differently. You could have said, if you know that she would have wanted to refuse this, then you ought to go with that refusal, whether or not it's in her best interest. That would have been a kind of substituted standard. It would have been to, to push the autonomy value into, onto this side of the screen. Um, but the statute, I think, very deliberately didn't go that direction. So you could say, if you're a real like human rights sort of perspective person, you could say, it's a kind of a halfway measure, right? When we look back 20 or 30 years from now, we might say, you know, the Medical Capacity Act was a landmark on the way towards full empowerment of patients and objects of care. Um, or we might say, wow, it was a beautiful sort of, you know, compromise between these two competing values. We don't know which way it's going to turn out yet, but the point is, it's not a pure autonomy piece of legislation. It's got these two competing values, and it's got a very specific strategy for managing the inevitable antinomial pressures that will arise when you've got competing values. Wouldn't the argument against that be that you can never know what her preference would be at that point? 
not completely. Yeah. Because she's never been in that situation before. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm a skeptic. I think you very rarely know many, very many things. Uh, but I think that uh, the, uh, you've got to operate on the basis of your best judgment as to what those interests would be. So It just it, concerns me when people yes. sort of talk in absolutes about, yeah, I know this to be true. Yeah, good, exactly. And maybe I even said that. Yeah, maybe we can bring it to, the, uh, that's, it, Think of it as a thought. I mean, there are cases, we've got real cases, where there's overwhelming evidence uh, about what those preferences were. But another part of this is people don't know what their own preferences are, actually. There's plenty of evidence. People are terrible at predicting what they'll want and what they'll be willing to live with. So that's another, that's a rationale for leaving the paternalistic value in place there. Yeah, yeah no, exactly following on from that, I worked with somebody who had led a chaotic life with substance misuse. He had a fall related to that, and a very severe spinal injury resulted. And he said it was the best thing that had ever happened to him. Although at the time he wouldn't have thought that, he would have said, "I'd rather be dead." But he had um, enforced abstinence. He had a lot of attention. He felt very well cared for. Um, he then got a, a very nice adapted flat. He went into education. He became a social. Worker, whether that's a yeah. good thing or not. <laughs> and he learned how to ski. He joined a dis all, none of these things. In fact, he said, yeah. had he not had that accident, he probably would have just yeah. died. And but he would have claimed not to have wanted to have survived yeah. something like that. It's interesting that we talk about um, you know the so-called right to make bad decisions. One form of bad decision is a decision I subsequently regret. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and in a way, that, that's protected too. In a real autonomy environment, we protect people's right to make decisions they would subsequently regret, including making terrible advanced directives and so on. Um, so that data about how bad people are at predicting, that's just more data about how bad people are at acting in their own best interests. And we're saying, look, over here, we let people act against their own best interests, but over here, we say, no, we don't put up with that. Um, okay, let me go, uh, let me go on. Uh, the next question um, I want to consider is this. Under what circumstance does the law mandate best interest decision making? Now, in a certain way, we've seen uh, the answer to that already. We've been through the statute yesterday. We've been through the, the legal terrain. So we kind of know the answer. But I, this is one of these cases where it seems to me it takes a while for this to sink in, really. And so I just want to present it in a different way. This is actually a couple of slides that Fabian um, and Tom put together, so I'm using their work. So look, the question, you might put it this way, isn't it the case we should always be in this best interest mode? Shouldn't all care and treatment decisions be made in the best interests of patients and clients? I mean, doesn't that seem odd? We're carers, after all. Shouldn't we always have our patients' best interests in mind? Uh, and you know what, the answer is kind of yes and no. <laughs> And actually, kind of, no, it turns out to be the answer. Uh, the, why is that? Um, we can, well, look, the yes part first. We expect the relationship of care to patient to be one of beneficence. But the best interest decision-making framework is, in fact, strictly limited by law and by the rights of patients. Okay? You only get to the best interest decision-making framework at a, under certain sorts of circumstances. It was a presentation we were uh, with Gareth at the Ministry of Justice in July, and who was that oath, this uh, like medieval Maimonides, was it Maimonides, the oath of Maimonides, this medical oath, uh, kind of like the Hippocratic oath, but one of the clauses in that really struck me, Maimonides said that the, the doctor should only ever see in his patient a suffering creature. That's the only. That's the only thing. Not a profit center or you know a potential litigant. No, your your view of that patient should just be seeing it as a suffering creature. That should dominate the doctor-patient relationship. Not anymore, right? Not anymore. You now have. Not only do you have to think about him as a profit and a cost center and a potential litigant, but you also have to see him as a bearer of rights. One of those rights is not to be subject to your paternalism, right? So there's again. The, 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 that's a really important point to see that the best interest decision making, although in a certain way it's intrinsic to every caring interaction, there's a way in which it's really boxed up. Okay, so let's see how that works. So when are best interest decisions made? Um, here's the, this, these are the slides that 
Fog, you know, Tom put together. What's the set? It's kind of a decision tree to go to go through. What's the first step? First, we have to figure out well, what's the decision to be made. As far as the law is concerned, we're not interested in people's state. We're interested in a particular decision-specific uh, 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 situation. So, is it a, a, where to live? Is it whether to uh, submit to surgery? Whatever. We have to figure that financial. Um, and then we have to ask: Does P have mental capacity to make that particular decision? That's what we talked about this morning, right? That's the capacity assessment, and either that's green or red, either they do or they don't. Remember, the law has no gray on it. Is it a yes or yes or no? We have to divide the field. If the answer is yes, they got the right to make decisions without their, that are not in their best interest. Best interest decisions don't apply. Yeah? If the answer is no, you're not even there yet, right, because it's possible we could delay the decision. Right? Maybe they're uh, incapacitous because they're unconscious, but we're expecting them to come out of their anesthetic in a few hours, and we can delay the decision until that point. Maybe this issue about whether to remove them from their housing situation is one we can play out over a little while. Maybe this decision about whether to submit to surgery in the John the Convict case is uh, one that we can let it run for a few days, and we'll see how he feels about it then, right? So if we can delay the decision, then we're still not acting in his best interest. Yeah? There, it's only now when we get to know to both of these questions that we find ourselves in the best interest decision making framework. All right, so there's a, now look, that's a simplification, as we'll, you'll all be thinking, wait a second, this is even more complicated than that, right? So let's just add in the complexity. That's the way in which I end up. That, you know, my, my beneficence is informing my whole relationship to the patient, but it's only when I get down here that I'm really in the best interest decision making framework. But look, it's more complicated than that, because right from the beginning, there are off-ramps from this decision tree. Right? The act, you'll remember, has certain decisions that you never can make in somebody's best interest. A lot of my fellow Americans, I'd like to help them vote in their own best interests, uh, but I'm not allowed to, right? That's forbidden. Um, so is adoption, like marriage. I mean, there's a list of six or seven uh, exemptions. These decisions never come in to the best interest decision-making context. So that's an off-ramp. I'm outside of the best interest framework. On the other hand, as we've seen, maybe this is a mental health case um, in which we're going to adopt a very different sort of approach to this um, uh, altogether. We'll treat it under the Mental Health Act. So we never really even get to the question of capacity there. That's not the, uh, that's not the issue. So suppose we get past those off-ramps. Again, we're at the capacity assessment. There's the yes and the no. On the yes, there are actually ways in which we can end up in a best interest sort of framework. In particular, if it turns out that we come to the conclusion that P is a vulnerable adult that has capacity, maybe they're subjected to undue influence or coercive relationships and so on, um, we have to ask that question. If they're not, then again, this should be a different color, really, it seems to me. Um, you're back in you no know, best interest decision degree. If, you, if the answer is yes, then um, you're in the uh, inherent jurisdiction of the court, maybe, complicated area of law. We'll talk about that a bit tomorrow. At any rate, you'd have to apply to the court, I think, um, in order to really make uh, best interest decisions. But there is a way in which society as a whole ends up in best interest framework along that particular route. Whoops, too far. Um, on the no side, uh, we've already seen this sort of route to best interest, but there are other uh, uh, roots here as well. Suppose the person has an advanced decision. Again, you never get, and if it's valid and it's applicable and it hardly ever happens, but uh, okay, it is recognized by statute. Anyway, there's another off ramp there. You see what I'm, the point I'm making? Best interest beneficence is part of, intrinsic to the care relationship, but law is really boxing it up in this one particular domain. Uh, and confining it, trying to confine it there, and there's all sorts of ways in which you might never, you might never get there. Okay? Um, the, uh, look, okay, that's the complication about getting there. What, if you are there, if you do get down to that bottom right-hand corner, uh, then the question is who decides? Who's the best interest decider in this situation? This is complicated, and in fact, I, I, I'm realizing now this uh, the, the, the slide we've got here doesn't really begin to capture the complexities. 
But look, just uh, to take a first stab at it, um, we'd have to first ask whether P has an enduring power of attorney or a lasting power of attorney or a court appointed, a court appointed deputy. Um, if they do, um, and the decision is within the attorney or deputy's remit, then the attorney decides, okay? So the carer's out here um, not really making the decision. Um, if the answer is no, you can see it's pretty, uh, it gets pretty complicated though. I mean, the presumption would be, okay, there's no deputy, there's no attorney here. Um, the, the carers and practitioners decide, except of course it could be contested in a certain kind of situation you get to the public court of protection. Um, decides um, if it's not contested, then the uh, the uh, practitioner decision stands. So, look again. I want to, actually, there's only certain sort of circumstance in which you, as a carer, are find yourself in this um, situation of making best interest decisions on behalf of an uh, incapacitated person. All right. Comments about that? Questions about that? Have I got that more or less right? Yes. I wonder if there's a, another step in your flowchart right at the top where the first question is, is the person making the decision we want them to make? And then we say, have they got capacity? Because I kind of feel it's only when they're saying no that we start stepping in and assessing capacity. And we're not often thinking if someone has capacity when they're agreeing to yeah. anything. Good. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's relevant. Yeah. Useful, but I mean, would you? I mean, my sense of that is that that is a feature of practice. But it's one that's not really recognized in the law. Um, is that fair? Yeah. Um, so what we got here is the legal picture, nice and neat, right? Um, and it treats these sorts of questions equivalently, refusals and, uh, and consent. Um, and it's saying the same kind of framework applies to both. But we all know that, in fact, it's when somebody is refusing that the, this apparatus really kind of kicks in. Uh, this is one of these things where I feel like you can tell the story as a tragedy, uh, as a sort of pernicious story, or you can tell it so you can see that, that maybe that's part of the well-functioning uh, community. I mean, I, again, I won't go back to my decision community hobby horse here, but I mean, you can think about how, one way in which a decision community can be well-functioning is if there's certain kinds of presumptions that the experts' decisions stand unless challenged, right? That's one way in which you can think. I mean, somebody had the mechanic case, right? I mean, I want to have the, Ben, I were talking about this at lunch. I want to have the right to challenge my mechanic, but actually what I, I want to, I'd much rather have it that I don't need to challenge my mechanic, right? The, uh, you, can, you can think about a good functioning medical decision process is one, right? You know, it's a good thing that, you know, we're not wasting our time raising this in every instance. But it's really important that it's there as an option uh, to, to carry through when the refusal comes around. Um, the, but anyway, it seems to me it's, it depends how you look at that. You want to say some more about that? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, sometimes it doesn't seem to matter if they're agreeing and you just carry on. But sometimes the most interesting outcomes arise when someone disagrees. You may end up thinking of a less restrictive treatment that actually might suit them much better. And that's only come about through this whole best interest Good. discussion yeah. because they didn't agree. Whereas if they just go along with it, you may end up doing more invasive yes. Good. treatments that aren't Empowering patients uh, has some of these results. Good. I mean, you may, you, I'm sure you already know this data that from Gareth and Matthew's study about the prevalence of incapacity just in general hospital settings. What is it? Something like 60 percent of the general hospital population at any given sort of snapshot in central London uh, turns out to be uh, lack of capacity. Most no, most of those are not being dealt with through formal capacity. It would break the system if they were. Um, you just do the right thing. Yeah. Hmm, that's not what the law says exactly, but that's what happens. And it's probably a good thing that that's what happens. Yeah. Well, the, the advance decision and the attorney bit is on the, but never, on, the, not on the best interest side of the divide. But the, aren't they attempt to kind of introduce almost kind of substitute autonomy into that side? Yeah, about yeah, yeah. Fabio, you want to come in on this? Yeah, the, the advance directive is not on the best interest. Uh, the advance directive is you just do what the person, with, you yeah. know, if it's a valid and applicable advance directive, you just stick to it, whether it's in their best interest. But at that side, in terms of the original, going back about the antinomy, you've got the capacity in the best interest. Yes. You're only going to use the advance decision because the person lacks capacity. So the yes. decision moves across the threshold. Yes. And it's, but you're still an 
autonomous thing. Yeah, good. That's, so by, 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 uh, uh, by allowing advanced directives, uh, the law was valuing autonomy. Yes. And it turns out, I don't know, if it, yes. it, it's quite a lot of evidence that a lot of those advanced directives are not in the patient's that's best right. interest, um, it turns out. You're right, though. That's quite seems right. And the same for the attorney, because the attorney is supposedly the person. Well, it seems to be there, it's different. I think the attorney, go ahead, Fabian. So I think the attorney is, at least at the moment, under the best interest framework of the NCA. Yes. They have to yes. make an objective judgment right. on behalf of the, pay, right. of the person. So that's a, big, that's a difference between yes. the advanced directive and the attorney. That's, that's mm. right. Yes, but the attorney is appointed by the capacitous individual. That makes right. a difference. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Appoint your, own best, your own best appoint your own best interest assessor, basically. Is that a way of putting yeah. it? But they still have to be making a decision about your best interest, not just what you would have done. That's true. Yeah. And the code of protection might challenge it. So these are all respects, it seems to me, again, to hammer my main point in which this is a hybrid, an ethically hybrid bit of uh, approach to this, the problems in this area. Yes, Lucy. Actually, I just wanted to contrast. I'm not, I'm not, an ex I'm not comparative law student, but I've been doing a bit of digging around the British Columbia Representation Agreement Act, 1996. Uh -huh. Sorry, a bit of a mouthful. But under that act, they use a much more relaxed way of appointing what we would call deputies. Yes. Uh, basically, the, the person can nominate somebody to make specified circumscribed decisions on their behalf, but there isn't this, there isn't a best interest framework. Like, you could potentially say, and I want you to decide like that. Yeah. Um, so you, you do have more potential for what yeah. Uh, it's often called authentic. I think that's on our website, Lucy. The uh, Antal did some super interesting work for us a few months ago, where he said, "Look, the, I mean, part of the, the conviction here, this is an intrinsic problem to any liberal jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and then let's look around and see how other jurisdictions have solved it. And as you say, mm -hmm. there are a range of different sorts of solutions, and how they manage this antinomy is is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so go on. Oh, um, There's a chart, by the way, on the website, which so gives... The interesting thing else. about how somebody appoints a deputy, though, or representative under the BC Act, is that it doesn't use this cognitive test of capacity. It looks at the quality of relationship between the individual and the nominee. It looks at issues like trust yeah. um, wow. and consistency of relationship and yeah. the history of it. Good. So it, it does offer a lot more potential for people, particularly with uh, developmental disorders, who may have never had yeah. capacity to yeah. say, actually, mm -hmm. I want my sister or my mum to decide not. Right. Yeah. yeah, okay, interesting. And the quality of the relationship is not the status of the relationship as a maternal one, no. but it's about, yeah, okay, good, that's a very Canadian solution. <laughs> and it's really inviting the judges and lawyers to come in and evaluate my relationship to yeah. my sister. Yeah. Right.